the Vichy market spike for five years. I mean, they have been doing that. Yeah. I mean, um, are you waiting till the end also? No, I don't think so. I just have to 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 have and so I went through the presentations and I didn't see it. So, all right. It's all good. All right. So you got it. Yeah, um, you this is Norbert. Yeah. Norbert's going to do the closeout because I got to do the closeout over at FRC. So okay. we'll just make a couple of little closing comments at the end. Okay. Okay. The rest uh, of it is yours. Thank you, guys. So one more minute. We're going to make everybody move to the front. <laughs> Before we do an independent study, get the independent study to make sure you can do it. Drinks or something. Yeah. Because some conferences are good to at the very end. They do the giveaway. Yeah. 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 Ye
And in doing that, what they did is they graded back the shoreline. Grading back the shoreline meant undermining structures. So this is a picture of their process to, uh, to uh, lay back the bank before building the seawall. This is our plant. And I want you to just take a close look at the window and the arch shape of this window. Uh, because in the current day, when we send divers down to see what debris in the river looks like, we see pictures like this. And on the left, you can see the arch shape there. That's actually a wall with a window in it. This was in 30 feet of water, about 40 feet offshore of the seawall. And that's a, another one of the brick walls that fell into the river. So they didn't haul away the debris that they were knocking down. They just let it fall into the river. This is the seawall itself. It's a crib structure of huge squared logs. And the face is um, seamless. So there's basically no transmissivity through this wall from its base to its top. And those red lines that you see in the bottom and the front are sheet piles made of wood. And so this is a hydraulic barrier. And this is important for our design because all the groundwater that comes from the uplands to the river gets diverted beneath that wall. And then the expression of it is further out into the river. We don't have upwelling adjacent to the wall. And that was a really helpful thing for us because the groundwater is contaminated too. This is a, a great historical photo. These are the folks that built the seawall. And so when, you, when I was talking about that lumber being used to build the facing, you can see they just put them edge to edge on the front and then build a matrix backwards for support. And then everything behind that was filled with uh, gravel and brick and rock uh, for stability. So it's a huge, massive structure. Uh, the selection of the remedy and the permitting process uh, took uh, a little bit of time, but it's a lot quicker than our work with EPA. So we went from feasibility work to design to approval in about three years. And I wanted to construct this remedy in 2019, uh, but the, the permitting process got in the way, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The design itself is fairly straightforward. This is the kind of design you see in many of these sites. It's a combination of dredging, capping, EMNR, and MNR. Um, I'll point you just as a highlight on this picture to the pink area. Uh, that is a hotspot under Oregon rules. That's a hotspot is defined as having a concentration that requires a preference for removal. Uh, and the black hatches that you see in that pink area is actually a thin layer of tar. So we had tar placed on this. This is a mound as well. Um, so the tar is on top of the debris. We're not really sure how a layer of tar got on top of the debris after the building was uh, basically collapsed into the river. Uh, but that was the configuration that we had to deal with. Uh, the A area is the green area along the uh, face of the seawall there. And I'm gonna just point your attention there because uh, we couldn't dredge there. Uh, dredging by the seawall would have undermined the stability of the wall and we didn't wanna do that. So we had to have an offset from the seawall. And uh, because of that condition I mentioned earlier, where we had groundwater diversion and no flux through that zone, we were able to cap it without having to do significant dredging. This is what this translates to in terms of the dredge footprint. So the color scale here just shows you depth of dredge prisms, uh, but this is this when with Sevenson went out to do this work, this was the target depth profile. This was the cap. Uh, we after several of the areas, as I mentioned, after dredging was completed, we covered with caps uh, because we couldn't get deep enough to remove some of the source material. Uh, again, because of either slope stability for undermining the seawall or because we had clean material uh, in a layer above buried material. And we wanted to be protective of the buried material, but we didn't feel like we had to chase after it. And DAQ, DAQ agreed with us. So we had activated carbon as our uh, amendment to the cap. And that was based on some testing that Sevenson had done in its lab. Uh, and we knew how much carbon we needed to be a protective over the time frame required by DAQ, which was 100 years. Uh, which was a minimum of 4%. Uh, and so that became a pretty important spec for this, this design and this construction project. 
Uh, the capping is another element, and this is just the spec that uh, Sevenson had to achieve for capping. And you can see the color gradient here is uh, a cap thickness gradient. And the cap thickness was based on the concentrations of material that were beneath the cap, the flux uh, that we were seeing through those sediments, and the duration for which the cap had to be designed. Uh, I mentioned construction and permits earlier, like everybody's projects, we had a ton of permits, ton of costs, kind of negotiations. What was really crazy though, is, I don't know if I can work with a pointer here. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. I'm just gonna highlight these guys. Um, this is a, a state agency, uh, the Oregon Department of State Lands, and we had to get an easement to be able to do the work from the state lands folks because they own the river bottom. And they require easements for activities like this because we leave permanent structures called caps in place. Uh, the easement process took a lot longer than we thought. Uh, I had plans to build this project in 2019. We had materials already on the way. Uh, we were up against the wall in June of uh, 2019, and we still didn't have the easement from the DSL. We were, we were stuck on the cost of the easement. Uh, so we had to pull the plug on the project. Uh, we had to stage the materials that uh, had been already delivered to our staging facility uh, and pick it back up the next year. Fortunately, we were able to resolve the issue with Division of State Lands, and we did uh, get the permit in, or the easement in place for the subsequent year, which was last year. Construction itself uh, began on time. We have in-water work windows in Portland. They basically start in July, they end in October. Uh, we do that because of endangered species of fish. Uh, and so we had a very, very specific time frame that this work had to be completed in. If we didn't finish before the fish window ended, we would have had to demob and remob the next year. Uh, the construction itself was, I think, a very elegant design. Uh, we used a moon pole. Water quality is an issue in Portland, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't have any water quality exceedances. We had criteria that we had to measure daily uh, in water samples, both chronic and acute. Uh, and so that moon pole system here uh, is designed to depend uh, curtains on both sides of these walkways all the way uh, to the bottom or near the bottom. We, we left about a foot of opening below the base of the curtain so fish could escape. Um, and you can see here, we have a long stick excavator. Uh, we also had a crane with a bucket for deeper water if we needed it. Uh, we liked the long stick just because it gave us a little more precision. Uh, and we had low water uh, in the summer here. So we were able to use that for most of the work. And then of course, a splash plate to go from the moon pool into the storage barge. Uh, this is also what we use to transport it to our facility at the Port of Portland. That becomes important in a minute uh, because the Port of Portland is where we were amending this material before sending it to the landfills. Uh, these tanks here are elutriate water storage tanks. Uh, some of our big projects, what we do is we build treatment plants on the river and then discharge back into the river. This was a smaller project, so we decided to stage the elutriate and then dispose of it in, a, in an offsite uh, facility. And then, of course, uh, GPS system for controls. And then we had several support boats, uh, including tugs to move things around. And uh, these guys brought materials and personnel every day. Debris removal was a big deal for us. We had a lot of uh, material, uh, obviously, because everything was pushed into the river when the seawall was built. But we also had other materials that have been deposited over time. We have tree trunks. Sorry. Uh, uh, tree trunks, bricks and concrete from the wall. We, we found a wagon wheel uh, from the 1800s. Um, we had a wall segment, anchors, ladders and shopping carts, a lot of bicycles. Removing the debris was important so that we could get in and dredge well and put our caps down. Um, we had to have an archeologist on site because of the historical issues that we have in Portland. Fortunately, none of the um, materials that we removed had to go into the historic register. Some of them were photographed, uh, but we were able to dispose all of these uh, dredged uh, debris. 
the water quality was perfect with the moon cool pool I mentioned before the water quality sampling you can see the boats out there we had to collect upstream and downstream water samples because the river reverses flow uh, this is a tidally influenced river even though it's pretty far from the ocean and the Columbia River is between it and the ocean uh, but the water is uh, moves so significantly at tides that we can see two to three foot tides in this river and at high tide we can sometimes have flow reversal Um, we had that layer of tar I mentioned. Uh, this just shows a picture of what the tar looked like. Uh, and this is a, a, just an image of the dredge cycling. And I like this because it shows you uh, both the moon pool in action and then the splash plate and the storage barge. One of the things that was really helpful for this site, I mentioned DEQ earlier, we had a lot of DEQ oversight. Uh, DEQ managed all of the public communications. So DEQ came out and they observed these sorts of operations. They were very happy with the way the operation was going. And they, they created a website and a blog for this project that was updated pretty much daily by the DEQ project managers. And so these kinds of images, these kinds of videos were posted on that blog so the public could keep track of this at the same time. That was the end of the great project where everything was going well. Uh, on July 23rd, one of the workers showed up and found on the moon pool, uh, right between the moon pool opening and the splash plate, a couple of rounds, a couple of rounds of ammunition. Um, uh, these are 22 millimeter rounds. Uh, we didn't know much about them at the time. We also found a rifle bullet. Uh, and one of the things that I, I forgot to mention earlier is that after they built the seawall, this is the alignment of the seawall, uh, they built a park behind it. And so we have a lot of pedestrians. Uh, there's actually a fairly high, uh, large homeless population in Portland uh, that spends time in the park and a lot of, a lot of active use, bikers, runners, skateboarders. Um, so there's a lot of people who use this, this park. Um, what we had to do was shut down the job because we didn't know how much munitions there were. We really didn't know what they were like. And so Sevenson actually found a vendor in Florida that specializes in mech, mech being munitions and explosives of concern. Well, it turned out uh, that we had high explosives. Uh, we had incendiary rounds. We had some practice rounds. Uh, and that these things had hazardous fragmentation distance of uh, hundreds of feet which meant we had to shut down the entire park. We had to create safety zones. Uh, what you see here is a plexiglass safety observation post that we built for the DEQ. So when we were removing MEC, we were able to do that. Uh, the other thing that we ran into is the Port of Portland, when they heard that we might have munitions in our sediments said, oh, you can't use our uh, area for amending anymore. So the team had to work to find another location to set up a, a sediment sorting facility to remove these munitions. And that's what this looks like. This is in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, and this is the sorting operations itself. We had uh, trommels going, we had a Tarek sorting machine. And then this is one of the mech experts that was flown in from Florida. They would physically rake every cubic foot of material to make sure there were no uh, munitions or fragments of munitions left. We had a three quarter inch spec. So every Every you know, six inch uh, layer of, of sediment had to be raked to that spec to, to visually confirm that there were no munitions left in the sediments. Then the sediments had to be put back into the barge for stabilization before being sent to the landfills. The landfills would not accept anything that potentially contained munitions. Uh, so that's why the sorting was very important. Uh, this was one fun day where we brought up a bucket and it had a whole case of uh, incendiary and explosive rounds. Uh, this is, oops, sorry. And this is an example I was uh, talking before about that spec because not all of the rounds were whole. Sometimes they, they segregated. And so we had to look for the pieces, not just the whole rounds. Um, we found a mortar 
Uh, fortunately, it was inert, which means somebody had brought it back as a souvenir after removing the insides. That would have changed our spec one more time. Um, this is just more photos of the rounds. And on the right here, uh, this is a storage facility that the Air National Guard brought us. The Air National Guard ultimately took responsibility for all the munitions we recovered and disposed of them. Uh, this is our sediment disposal processing facility. So the barges that left the Vancouver facility where the sorting happened were pushed upstream uh, about 60 miles. Uh, and we have a transloading facility here uh, that we built to take those post sorted sediments and translate them into trucks. And then the trucks went to two different county, uh, two different landfills. One, Wasco County, uh, took our subtitle D non hazardous material. Uh, the Arlington landfill uh, took the hazardous waste. Once we had the mech situ sorted out, uh, Oregon caught fire. Over a million acres burned. Uh, my house was under ec evacuation notice. Uh, the air quality in Oregon was hazardous. Uh, so they were telling people, don't leave your house. Uh, Portland's, you know, right here in the middle of all the, the worst of it. This is just a picture in the middle of the day of what our uh, sorting facility looks like. Uh, so we had to shut down when the wildfires hit. Fortunately, we didn't have to evacu evacuate our personnel or demob our equipment. The fires never quite reached Portland, uh, but they got within about 30 miles of us. Uh, a note on health and safety uh, that the air quality kind of triggers. First, we have to be protective. We had to set uh, limits on air quality when it was safe for workers to go back, exposure times, things like that. This was on top of the COVID protocols that got added after the project was designed in the first place. So the health and safety management of this uh, completely safe project, it was done in 100% in safety, uh, was very complex and involved a lot of updates to both the construction management plan, health and safety plan, and the uh, sampling safety plan. Uh, I just wanted to show you a picture of the carbon amendment. I mentioned earlier the importance to DEQ of having the right mix. Uh, we were successful in achieving that. This is just a bucket placement. Uh, we found that by lowering the bucket into the water, we had much better control of carbon content in the placed cap materials. So instead of dispersing the material on the surface, we lowered it down close to the bottom before opening it up. Uh, and then the other thing that we did that was innovative that I really like is we built these sampling ports um, and they're fairly large and we, we placed the base of them on the top of the reactive zone of the cap and then the armor went up around the sides and so there's access plate here and then we can send divers down and the, the ports are filled with sediment uh, and there are uh, sampling ports already built into them so all the divers have to do is go down attach a, a sampling device to the end of the tube, pull the water out, and we have a representative uh, pour water sample from the top of the cap. And we built these because we are in an area where recontamination is expected. And we didn't want to be in a situation where we were arguing over a sediment hit after five years of monitoring uh, that might have been from the site or might have been brought there uh, through currents. Uh, so this gives us a very, uh, a uh, good system to show repeatable results from the same location. And if we have breakthrough of the cap, we'll know right away. Uh, as we proceeded with the construction, uh, we did daily surveys. Sometimes we did surveys three or four times a day. Uh, we were in active converse, communication with DEQ on a daily basis. They would see these. We would say, this is what we think we should do next. We, you know, we're, we're almost at spec. We don't think we should have to go back here. You know, uh, and DEQ would say whether they agreed with that or not. Um, and so these are just examples of progress surveys. And you can see the different grid sizes here. We have a much finer grid along the seawall where we weren't dredging and capping than we do out here in the areas where there were where there was dredging and capping. So. Uh, our spec criteria were finer in those areas where the, the remedy itself was somewhat less protective for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so uh, we also did uh, verification for capping. And you can see these, these color gradients here, just 
uh, talk about the dredge um, elevations after completion and prior to capping, and then elevations post capping here on the right. Uh, so the, the project itself in terms of the construction went about as seamlessly as you can. We, we tested the carbon content using pans and some other methodologies, and we had much more carbon than the spec required. And so DEQ was very happy with that because it's a protective remedy even past the durations that we had predicted with our modeling. Uh, in October 13th, 2020, this is the approval completion map. And this was exciting for us. If you look at the date here, well, if you, you could, if I actually didn't change the slide. Uh, if you look at the date here, we were two weeks ahead of the end of the in-water work window. So in spite of finding mech, which required shutdowns, in spite of the wildfires, which required shutdowns, in spite of COVID, in spite of the fact that Port, Portland itself was in a center of political unrest and we had uh, issues related to security, from that overflow. Uh, all of those things affected this project, but at the end of the day, it was completed on time. And believe it or not, when you take the MEC cost aside, it was completed under budget. So kudos again to my team. Uh, Post-construction monitoring was also fun. Again, we, we put in the sampling ports. So we went out in year zero to get a baseline set of information. Uh, we collected pour water from the top of the cap. Uh, we also collected Trident probe uh, data from, from areas where we didn't have these installed. We collected three-point sediments uh, samples, and then we also collected surface water samples. Um, all of these results came back exactly as we expected, which was no concerns. Uh, so that was a nice uh, baseline condition for future monitoring. Uh, key outcomes from this project, uh, again, the team was incredible. No matter what got thrown at this team, they found a solution and DEQ was with us every step of the way and approved things in real time. Uh, folks, you, you've probably dealt with agencies that were reluctant to commit to change without a lot of back and forth, a lot of thinking. Uh, this team was very responsive and it really made us uh, successful. Uh, the tar-like material was successfully removed. All the dredge areas, we achieved all the specs. Uh, the moon pole was perfect. I really recommend folks consider that if you have um, uh, you know, a dredge in an area where water quality is a, a major concern. Uh, we removed all the debris and had a smooth surface prepared for cap placement. Uh, the carbon placement was optimal. The docents expedited the design. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we were able to get it done in the window that we had, which was very important. Um, the DEQ was not just the communications coordinator with the public, but they also interfaced with the, um, the Air National Guard, which was the federal agency that agreed to come and manage the munitions for us. Uh, and then those innovative sampling ports are something that I've seen in a few other sites, uh, but I'm going to be using them in my larger project downstream when I build that because I like the idea of repeatability in a data set. And folks like Carl Gustafson at the EPA headquarters level and CSTAG uh, really like the idea of being able to compare data through time from the same location. Uh, and then year zero confirmed we're working. So with that, I'll see if there's any questions. Great presentation. I, that's the most aptly titled presentation I've seen at this conference. <laughs> so uh, anybody have any questions? We have a mic we can circulate. Thank you. All right, excellent. All right, let's bring up next. Uh, Marcus Biker from uh, Ramble is out of their Michigan office. And his title is Phase Construction of a DNAPL Recovery System to Reduce Client Risk and Increase Third Party Property Owner Confidence. So that's your advance, that's your uh, point. Great, thank you. All right, thank you everybody for sticking around with me. Um, this is kind of a case study of a phased implementation of a DNAPL recovery system. So I'll start with. Uh, a review of kind of the how we got to this point and then review some of the lessons learned from the recovery system. 
Uh, before I move on, I want to thank uh, co-authors, Jennifer Hagen, who's the program manager for this client, uh, Andrew Barbeau, who is out uh, getting dirty, helping operate the system uh, and optimizing it for the pilot study, and then Patrick Keeney, our client. A little bit of a background about the site. This is a former manufactured gas plant site on the western shores of Lake Michigan, outlined in red on the screen there. Uh, operational between late 1800s to mid 1900s and a fairly sp small facility compared to what we're typically dealing with. But um, you'll note on the screen that uh, down or upgrading of the facility, there's a locomotive rail yard. And uh, this locomotive rail yard had releases of coal tar, or sorry, of uh, locomotive diesel over the years that then migrated underneath the MGP and mixed with the uh, releases of MGP residuals over the years and resulted in a a plume that was uh, of an apple that's lower in viscosity and more recoverable than we're typically accustomed to seeing at these MGP sites in this area. And that's the problem we are dealing with today. So on the photo here, uh, that is the uh, delineated plume from an apple thickness and monitoring wells from the remedial investigation report. Uh, and as you can see, it's a pretty extensive plume, 6.5 acres or so that radiates onto a property owned by a variety of different entities, mainly not our client. And so as we were moving on from the remedial investigation report to the feasibility study, we started to look at the restrictions that each of these property owners would have on the types of remedies that could be uh, incorporated uh, on their properties. Um, the marina had some time uh, things that we were concerned about, needing to do, do construction outside of the boating season. The chemical plant in the middle of the uh, site right here, um, their main constraint was they do not have secondary containment for any of their process for their tanks within their facility. They rely on their parking lot to serve as secondary containment uh, of all their tanks. So their stormwater system has valves on it and they cannot, they, a precipitation event happens, they inspect for spills and then open those valves. And so we cannot disturb any significant surface area on their property without having to account for maintaining the integrity of that containment. We have a warehouse facility right here. This is now a boat storage facility here, a railroad in the middle and our client site with very limited NAPL uh, impacts uh, down at the page south. And so with all those constraints, we started to look at different options. Uh, excavation, ISS, we're not really gonna be practical given some of the restrictions. There's a large building in the middle here of the NAPL plume that we are always gonna be combating some residual NAPL at this site. And so in lieu of trying to do a uh, contingency uh, based record of decision, we decided to move forward with a focused feasibility study to assess the NAPL impacts. And then we would decide how to manage the remainder of the impacts based on the success of that NAPL remediation. So we moved forward with a focused feasibility study with the US EPA this is in the Superfund site program. And we looked at a variety of different remedies ranging from vertical engineered barriers, some passive NAPL recovery, physically enhanced recovery, which basically like a water flood, uh, chemically enhanced recovery or a surfactant flood, uh, which we heard about in the previous session, and then thermally enhanced recovery. Uh, and EPA is the decision maker on the uh, remedy at the site. And at the end of the feasibility study, they chose this physically enhanced recovery system or a water flood system for NAPA recovery at the site. And the concept is pretty simple. You have a, oops, sorry, so go back, go to the laser point. You have a centralized uh, groundwater extraction point. That groundwater is extracted, goes to a treatment plant, and then you are re-injecting the groundwater on either side, manipulating the horizontal gradient to drive DNAPL to a, a central recovery point here. It is currently conveyed in a horizontal well configuration, but it can also be conveyed with vertical wells with similar effect. Once we knew that was the remedy that we were implementing for US EPA, then the extensive pre-design investigation scope was completed. During this phase, we were trying to figure out the footprint of potentially recoverable NAPL. And so we were doing soil borings, tar ghost with laboratory mobility uh, sampling to delineate the footprint of potentially recoverable NAPL. Uh, how much water was going to be produced and need to be treated was a pretty important variable. So we did a lot of hydrogeologic studies to assess um, flow rates and well spacing. We need to assess the compatibility of NAPL at the site. Uh, it's not just straight up coal tar, it's a mixture of coal tar with diesel. And so um, we need to com compare the NAPL against the types of components that would be in the system to make sure there would be extensive runtime. And then we also need to get some influent characterization so we could properly design this water treatment plant. At the uh, conclusion of the PDI, we reduced the footprint of the recoverable NAPL to, from the uh, outline here is the outline of that uh, plume previously in the RI and reduced it to that uh, 
that um, solid purple color area. And um, we also had observed some unique things now that we had higher density data, we previously didn't really have access to Ax Nobel, or sorry, the chemical plant in the middle um, prior to the PDI. And we had seen that NAPL, rather than being like sitting on the confining, local confining layer, uh, there are intermittent gravel lenses throughout the whole um, geology and NAPL was primarily migrating with those gravel lenses in the midst of uh, larger sand formation. So even differences between gravel and uh, uh, well-graded sand, NAPL was always migrating within that gravel lens and uh, the capillary barrier was prevented a downward migration of that finer sand material. And so in light of those constraints uh, and, and what we learned from the PDI, we started to lay out the preliminary design of the system for the whole site. And in doing so, based on the well spacing from the, uh, the pump test, we determined that 40 vertical wells would be required. As I mentioned before, we were thinking horizontal wells uh, for recovery in the feasibility study, but just based upon the layer cake geology here, um, horizontal wells were not accessed where the NAPL was located. And the client and the property owners did not want to use a one pass trench methodology, which could also gain access to that material. Um, we needed to inject a lot of water, about 150 GPM of water back into the aquifer. And that is hard to do in vertical wells. And so we transitioned to injection through horizontal wells to get this amount of water in the site. Uh, and you could get a little bit more uniform injection front. Uh, the, we still have the issue with five property owners where this infrastructure would need to be placed on. 150 GPM water treatment plant would be re required, but we, what we observed um, when we did this full scale um, analytical of the infant qual water quality, there was a lot of iron, calcium, manganese in the water. And as we are injecting those into well screens, there's concern that um, those will start to precipitate within the well screens, follow them to the point where we have a lot of uh, downtime on the injection side. So to combat that, we decided that we needed to use chemical precipitation to get all that iron, calcium, manganese out of the water so that it was not available to precipitate within these well screens. And it became clear from working with the client and discussions with the property owners, we had one shot to do this. There was a lot of negotiations for access to get us on the site. And no matter what we did, the worst thing would, would be that we needed to go out there and change something after the fact. Like we had need to be certain that our design was robust enough to account for whatever changes may happen in the future. And in light of that, we started to conceive of this project and instead of one mobilization into a two-phase project. The first phase of work would be done on the uh, uh, property largely owned by the utility, where we had a little bit more free reign to uh, validate some design assumptions. We would confirm well spacing and other design assumptions from the PDI. We'd evaluate a little bit longer runtime than you can do in laboratory compatibility testing about the FXC of certain materials and valves and the like to make sure they made sense for a full-scale deployment. We validated the well config, the extraction well configuration, the piping runs to make sure that those made sense for long-term runtime. And um, we were able to show the property owners adjacent to us um, the construction methodologies that would be employed so they could have a greater level of comfort of us doing that sort of stuff on their property. And so uh, the phase one uh, was, like I said, was located on the uh, property owned by the utility. There were three new uh, DNAP recovery wells, eight inch diameter wells with a sump in them. In this location of the site, there were three existing passive recovery wells that were six inches in diameter and did not have a sump, but those were sporadically located throughout the rest of the site. So we incorporated them into our design to see if we can make use of them or if we needed to use new wells uh, moving forward. There was one uh, horizontal injection well uh, right here to you know, inject that water and force it underneath the road towards the uh, recovery points. Unfortunately, as you can see, there is Pershing Road uh, in the site here and then Harbor Place uh, uh, is right here. And so when we're trying to lay out where the treatment plant would be located relative to uh, the Dean Apple presence, uh, it was apparent that at least two Jack and Boar crossings would be required to connect all of our infrastructure together. So we, though we had to incorporate two of those. And then we had a 25 GPM groundwater treatment plant. Uh, and that was a, a rental system based on the conceptual design that we would validate further for the full scale. Um, a little bit of an overview of the extraction philosophy here before I kind of talk about the lessons learned of the pilot. So um, the decision was made rather than do a total fluids pumping philosophy where you're pumping groundwater and Dean and Apple simultaneously, that we wanted to have a separate groundwater pump that would be located within the screen interval. And that pump would largely be operating continuously at a higher flow rate. And then deeper in the well, uh, in, the, in the sump, we would have a smaller Dean Apple recovery pump and that would be pumped intermittently based upon uh, NAPL presence within that sump. 
And a couple advantages of this approach is one, um, this NAPL, the PDI, I didn't mention this previously, the NAPL was determined to be a characteristically hazardous via ignitability. So uh, it would be disposed of as a hazardous waste. And if we minimize emulsions and allow this uh, it to separate more readily in the oil water separator, we can send it to a cement kiln for beneficial reuse and reduce our disposal costs. And so we wanted to incorporate a uh, pumping methodology that would allow that to occur. But also it allowed us to optimize the groundwater extraction rates uh, to get the most DNAP recovery while minimizing the groundwater extraction rates by having the two pumps. So this was constructed from about 2019, October till March 2020. Um, COVID was hitting right at the tail end of, of, of the system. Uh, never thought we would still be dealing with it during the phase two of the site, but um, here we are. Um, and then we operated this system from April to November in, in the midst of COVID as well. Um, some lessons learned from the operations of this pilot system or phase one system. Um, regarding conveyance piping, uh, we were conveying DNAPL separate from, from the water stream as we discussed previously. And um, our mechanical engineers were telling me that because of the viscosity that we were observing uh, and the long run of the piping that we needed to heat trace those lines to about 70 degrees to keep that NAPL flowing. I was hopeful that they were wrong because there's extensive costs to um, heat tracing that amount of piping, but um, we operated with heat trace. We turned this, the heat trace off and that the pumps could just not convey NAPL to the recovery system. So we validated that we needed heat trace for the system regardless of how deeply buried these, uh, these lines were. We um, validated some of the design assumptions related to well configuration, the pumping types and the like. And one thing that we thought would be effective um, was using transducers. So having a transducer in the water column and a transducer in that Dean Apple sump, the specific gravity of Dean Apple is heavier than water. So when you look at the difference of those two, you can infer Dean Apple thickness. And this works pretty well for like Dean Apple transmissivity evaluations. But there was just a lot of agitation in this pumping cycles within these wells that there was just too much noise to reliably interpret d thickness using transducers. And so um, we were hopeful we would use those to control the d recovery pump operations. But in the end, keep it simple, stupid. Um, we're operating those based on timers and manual gauging for the phase two system. Um, regarding the extraction and ejection uh, philosophy here, um, we were able to validate that the air operated pumps that we had specified were effective at getting the drawdown that was required and achieving the flow rates. As I mentioned previously, the NAPL here is characteristically hazardous. So um, that presents some issues for electrical hazard classification with electric pumps. And so decision was made to use air operated pumps to minimize some of the concerns related to, um, to the, the electrical hazard classification. We were able to verify the well, the horizontal well was properly sized to get the flow rate of the water back into the, into the field. And we were also did some camera work down the horizontal well at the end of the pilot study and really observed very little um, iron precipitation in the bottom of the well. There was no calcification of the well slots. And so, uh, and, and the flow rate was able to be reliably uh, obtained during the pilot study. So we were able to show that the combination of the extra injection well design and that chemical, chemical precipitation stage was effective at getting some long runtime on these horizontal wells. Regarding groundwater treatment plant, we were able to confirm that it operated as we had hoped. And one of the more interesting things that we were able to validate is um, because of that chemical precipitation stage, we needed to use caustic soda to raise the pH and then sulfuric acid to bring it back down at the end. And within uh, the fire code, there's only a limit. You can only store about 500 gallons of these materials on the site at a given time. And so uh, by operating this pilot study, or sorry, if you go above that, then you need to use extensive fire suppression systems and the like to manage that risk. And so with getting some runtime of this pilot study system, we were able to validate the uh, consumption rate with the goal of only being on site about once a week. We were able to confirm that we could store um, 500 gallons would get us over a week of runtime without having to go to those extensive fire suppression systems or for the phase two design. And uh, we were also were concerned about emissions from the system. So we negatively pressurized all the tank head spaces uh, with a blower and then ran all that through carbon just to keep the emissions under control. And that approach was very effective at, there was no odor complaints throughout the whole project, given even though there's a lot of adjacent uh, industry and property owners that were concerned about our operations. So that odor suppression system was pretty effective at uh, minimizing that risk. 
once we kind of validated a lot of the mechanical components of the system, we then started to try to maximize uh, groundwater uh, DNAP recovery rates and minimize groundwater extraction rates. Um, at the beginning of the project, uh, the regulatory agency here was really pushing for maximum grading approach is what we called it, where you are extracting water to the maximum extent practical in your extraction points, all that water is getting re-injected into there and you're trying to maximize that horizontal gradient to drive Dean Apple to your recovery points. But obviously that means you're treating a lot of water and um, that is cost costly for our client with all the um, water treatment costs within the project. So we wanted to validate after knowing what that was capable of, what other pumping strategies could produce. And so we looked at some literature by Jason Gearhart and Bernie Cooper, who suggested that pulsed pumping could be similarly effective as this constant pumping approach in these types of scenarios. And we advocated to EPA that we should operate it in that capacity. And they, they approved of that and we operated that approach for a period of time. And that basically means that groundwater is being extracted continuously for a period of time. You allow it to rebound uh, until it it's at equilibrium and then you extract it again. But by doing an hour on or hour off, for example, you're cutting your groundwater flow rate in half for, that you need to treat. And then the passive recovery approach, um, we, this is a lot of infrastructure to get in the ground. Uh, we wanted to operate this system passively just to see what was the net benefit of operating this system compared to what passive recovery alone could achieve. What we found was actually pretty interesting. Um, during the maximum gradient pumping approach, we operated in that capacity for about 133 days. Uh, and over that runtime, we got about 0.7 gallons of coal tar denaple out of the ground per day, but we needed to extract 20,000 gallons of water per gallon of denaple that was extracted. When we operated the pulse pumping strategy for about 21 days, we were expecting to see a significant reduction in water um, extraction, but we had expected that denaple recovery rates would remain the same. But what we actually had seen is that the denaple recovery rates increased from 0.7 to 2.5 gallons per day under this scenario, which greatly changed our, uh, our ratios to about 4,000 gallons of water treated per gallon of denaple removed. Um, and when we were looking at the well screens, trying to figure out what might be causing this, uh, when we we're observing the cycling within these wells, looking you know, down the well itself, we saw that um, as water was rebounding, uh, you would see napple globules being entrained into the water. And then when you were sucking it back down, you also see, saw new napple being migrated through the well screen. And what we thought was happening here is that napple is present in these intermittent conductive lenses of gravel. And so by surging the aquifer up and down, you're effectively agitating that napple loose by saturating those pore spaces where previously those were not able to be migrated when they were desaturated of water. We also operated in a passive recovery approach for a handful of time and that produced about 0.1 gallons of Dean apple per day. Um, and so it validated that the pulse pumping approach was pretty effective in comparison to what passive recovery could achieve alone. I'm sure as I was thinking about your time, these Dean apple recovery rates are pretty low compared to the cost of implementing the system. Uh, we knew going in, this was a client owned area of the site, the viscosity of the Dean apple on the client owned property nearest to the release was higher than what we have um, further away from the uh, site in the in the more productive areas of our uh, of the uh, of the site closer to the lake, and it was just le less continuous in its thick in its presence and thickness. And so we did a lot of recoverability assessments after this phase one operations, bail down transmissivity testing, and uh, down gradient wells to confirm that indeed there was a lot more re recoverable napple in other areas that was not representative of this pilot study area. And so with all that information and the pulse pumping strategy, our client felt comfortable moving forward with a phase two design. So pass forward for the site. Um, we'd done groundwater monitoring in this area after this about six month pilot study, and it was pretty staggering. Um, benzene concentrations um, meet MCLs, napoline concentrations are ranging between one and 200 parts per billion. Um, and right now they are remaining constant for about uh, three events after this activity. We think combination of we were rem removing source obviously, but we're also injecting about 2 million gallons of clean water into the aquifer. And so we expect that we're gonna see some rebound at a period of time based on the residual mass that is left behind, but um, we'll be watching that in comparison to our end goals of, of eventually doing some restoration and m of groundwater quality. But the early results are pretty encouraging in this area that the mass reduction is doing some net good. Uh, phase two construction is currently underway. I should mention this uh, system 
doing this in this phased approach really streamlined our design reviews with US EPA. We started the design work in January of this year. We submitted a design report to EPA in late February. We had EPA approval of design in in May, and that this is a super fun site. Like to have design and EPA approval within six months is pretty, a uh, pretty staggering accomplishment that we're proud of. Uh, we expect, based on some preliminary modeling, that we will be operating the system for about five to seven years to until we get to a point of diminishing returns, as determined by a primarily a de decline curve analysis of NAPA recovery rates and some other lines of evidence. And then one of the advantages of using the air operated uh, pumps here is that we have air distributed throughout the whole site. And so if we would make the decision to convert these wells to biosparge to help facilitate degradation of the uh, remaining dissolved dissolve phase plume, we could do so at pretty limited costs. And then at the end, um, we'll be evaluating the quality at the end of this uh, DNAPA recovery remedy and see what makes sense for the remainder of the site. But we're hopeful that is some sort of uh, institutional controls uh, and MA of the remaining impacts. Um, and on the photo there, we need to do a third jack and board crossing beneath the railroad, and that was its own effort. That was successfully completed a couple months ago, um, and I could not leave the site. Uh, I was a certified engineer, so as long as that thing was going under the road, I had to sleep on site until it was done. So that was that was fun. But in any case, um, we feel like this was a, a success to implement this project in this way. The, the concern with this is that you might incur additional costs by doing two mobilizations, but with all the constraints at the site, we were able to validate some of the design assumptions, confirm well spacing. We confirmed that the components that we wanted to use were effective before we start deploying those sorts of components at 40 extraction wells. Um, we were able to show the third party property owners of this is what is gonna be happening on your site and get their level of comfort so we can move on to their properties with a little bit more effect. And then lastly, if you're thinking of doing a similar remedy at, at some of the year sites, um, we demonstrated that the pulse pumping strategy produces a lot more, less water, about 50% or, or less, depending on how, you, how much on and off time you have on those pumps. But it is, at our site, was four times more effective at getting NAPL into these extraction points. And so certainly would encourage you to consider that philosophy at your sites if you're operating a similar system. Um, and I think... Oh yeah, uh, I guess I did want to give thanks to our project team. We were implementing this towards the end of COVID, and so it was it was challenging to get some of these uh, supplies in that in that context. But uh, Strata Earth installed the vertical wells. Some environmental did the civil and mechanical scope, and subcontracted the Jack and Bore to a local bullseye drilling firm. Uh, Directional Technologies Inc. installed the horizontal well and helped facilitate some of the design efforts on that well. And Nutera provided the groundwater treatment plant. I guess with that, uh, we'll do questions right after. Yep, yep. Anybody have any questions for Marcus? Here's one. Yeah, Marcus, very interesting uh, talk. Thank so you. it was a mix of coal tar and diesel. Yes, uh, the diesel cut with the, we did some forensics work early on and uh, yeah, it, that validated that the signature was a combination of those two uh, constituents. What was the density? It was near to the near to the MGP, the density was about 1.1. The NAFL that actually migrated because that had a lower viscosity away, that density was about 1.03. And so okay. it's, it, it did present some issues in the se phase separation and the oil water separate actually, like a lot of that stuff is more or less neutrally buoyant. And so um, the chemical precipitation stage actually did do a fair bit of precipitation of NAPL that was not re removed by gravity in the oil water separator. Okay. Were there any wells that had only diesel in them, El Napple? Um, no. Okay. It seemed to more or less you know, fully mix through the MGP residuals and re represent itself as a, a D Napple at these locations. Um, we did we when we did the LIF work, we did see diesel like signatures with, on the tar ghost and the, that yellow green type response, but um, they didn't represent themselves as a separate phase product within the wells. Okay. And then last question about the um, different DNAPL recovery rates with yeah. continuous water flood versus pulsed water flood versus um, passive recovery yeah. of, of the DNAPL. Were the same wells used to compare those rates? Yeah, throughout the project, we had six wells and we were always operating um, the, the DNAPL 
pumping strategy remained the same. Um, it was just the fluctuating the groundwater extraction rates at those locations. Okay. And the, the passive recovery rate was measured at the end? That, yeah. You raise a valid point. Like that was some of our concerns all a lot. Like Dean Apple is moves slowly. And so that was like, was what we were seeing even during the pulse pumping strategy where we were just starting to see the positive effect of that gradient manipulation during the maximum range date approach, or was it really the pulse pumping strategy that was causing those increased uh, production rates? And uh, I guess we'll find out more with additional runtime, I guess, of the full scale system, because over the confines of the six month pilot study, um, we, we were just trying to use our time as wisely as we could. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. No, in, in hindsight, passive recovery probably wouldn't have been the nice thing to start off with and then transition into, but um, that's not how the regulatory agency viewed the project. So. Marcus, I have some questions. Oh. <laughs> Caught me off guard up here. <laughs> so most of the Dean Apple was in a gravel layer. Correct. So any guesses on what its residual saturation might be in that gravel and whether or not you're removing 20% of the Dean Apple or 70% yeah. of the Dean Apple with active recovery? We did do um, centrifuge tests and then we also did water drive tests during the PDI at, at lower gradients to try to assess initial versus residual saturation and develop in our heads what the actual recoverable mass might be in the subsurface. We've never actually wanted to share that externally because there's so many variables in that that we would be locked into. Like, unless you get 100,000 gallons of coal tar, you're not done. Um, and so we've successfully avoided putting that number out there. But um, in, that, in that gravel lens, like you said, the residual saturation, there's not much organic content and it's high porosity. Like we saw residual saturations around 10% in the water drive test. And so um, I think that is partly why we see these reductions in the groundwater plume is that we are getting a fair bit of that napple mass out, uh, out in that gravel lens and we're seeing reductions accordingly. Okay, and have you done composition analysis on the napple to see what the risk to groundwater might be once you're not pumping groundwater anymore? What, what it may recover to, um, rebound to? Not, no. I, I, We'll see what dissolved phase fractions come back <laughs> in time, and that'll that'll help us tell that tell that story. Okay, thanks again, Marcus. And now to bring us home, the whole way home, we're going to bring up Dr. Randy Sillen from AECOM, and he's going to talk about full scale implementation of aerobic biooxidation to deplete groundwater contaminants from coal tar. Take it away, Randy. Thank you. Uh, last but not least. So it's an interesting project that I've been working on for quite a while uh, at a site about an hour away in Daytona Beach. I want to acknowledge the, the client and co-author Randy Kaiser from Florida Power and Light, Next Era Energy in the back of the room uh, for all the support and uh, cool stuff that he lets us do at this site. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how we use some risk-based NAPO management strategies to develop a, an approach at this site that uh, really helps us with closure and coming up with a strategic way to close this site in a site that you normally wouldn't be able to close because of the amount of tar that's in the subsurface at the site. And it's, a, it's essentially an active facility, as you can see in this picture, it's a service center for the utility. And whoops, let's see, go back. It, the essentially the extent of the tar at the facility almost covers the whole paved area and down to about 20 feet. And so to come up with this plan, we needed a way to assess how we're able to reduce the risk at the site. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, a mo some models that we developed and that's, we're calling that the NAPL depletion model. And then I'll talk about the the site itself, uh, some of the implementation work we've been doing out there and some of the results we've gotten from the site. So when we started looking at, or when I started looking at trying to figure out how to clean up napples, we, our eyes were wide open back in the early to mid nineties. We had all these great ideas from the enhanced oil recovery industry that of ways to remove napple. And back then the only way you were gonna clean up a site is if you could remove all the napple 
And so we started investigating a lot of methods, including co-solvent, surfactant flushing. We developed a partitioning and a wall tracer test to estimate how much Snapple was in the subsurface. And this was work that we, we a lot of this was done up at uh, University of Florida. And we started, we can make any of this stuff work in the lab in a column. And then we started implementing some of this stuff in the field. And there was a lot of research money out there going to researching how these different technologies would perform at the field scale. And I was lucky enough to move to Hill Air Force Base, Utah for six months, where we did a lot of side-by-side -side testing of these technologies and isolation cells in a complex Snapple. And one of the things we learned pretty quickly between those study and then some follow-on studies with simpler napples that just chlorinated solvents here in the state of Florida, where we're doing D-napple and co-solvent flushing, your success is about 60% napple removal, 65% tops. And so we learned right away that you just can't get it all out. And you're not necessarily going to remove that risk to groundwater and achieve MCLs and with any of these cool innovative technologies that are complex and what's controlling that and, and we all know is the difference between a lab and the field is heterogeneity so the heterogeneous distribution of the napple associated with the heterogene heterogeneous distribution of hydraulic conductivity made it very difficult to control these processes in situ and to get all the napple out so when we talk about risk-based management of NAPL, there's usually two types of risk. You've got a composition risk and a saturation risk. We've heard a lot about the saturation risk, and that's where you've got NAPL pools or, or, or mobile NAPL bodies. And the, the risk there is you just have uncontrolled potential migration of that NAPL. And so there's a lot of work focused on assessing whether or not that NAPL is mobile. And if it is mobile, is that NAPL body migrating? Well, what we're focused on is more on the composition risk, because at a lot of these sites, we have NAPL is the source to groundwater plume, and those plumes may be off-site. Uh, the other type of composition risk that you might see at some sites are more for sites with volatile compounds, some of the chlorinated solvent sites, or even uh, benzene. So there's more of a, a vapor risk. And so what we're focused on is identifying what that risk is at these sites, and then developing a conceptual site model that describes those risks and then a remedy or management strategies that focuses on eliminating those risks. And so typically what we see at tar and creosote sites is we have a lot of NAPL at the site, but it's primarily at residual saturations. There are occasions if you put a well in the right spot, you're going to hit a pool of mobile NAPL that might be immediately around the well that will drain into the well. But overall, most of the NAPL at the sites at residual saturations. And a lot of these sites have been around for a long time. And so we already see some significant weathering in that NAPL and, and changes in its composition and its properties over the years. And the other thing that we typically see at these sites are pretty significant dissolved plumes because of these, of the number of compounds and the type of compounds in these NAPLs. And Mostly we see benzene, sometimes we see other BTEX compounds, but it's mostly PAHs. You know, naphthalene is one of the biggest components of both creosote and TARS. And when we try to apply these management strategies, what we're trying to do is decrease the amount of source mass such that the mass flux coming from that source can be attenuated in the plume itself. So can we reduce that source mass enough such that its mass discharge is decreased and the attenuation capacity of that plume is managing that plume on site. And so that's kind of one of the main concepts behind risk-based management of NAPL at some of these sites. And a lot of changes over the past 10, 15 years that allow us, instead of just focusing on trying to get NAPL out, let's just do risk-based management of the site. And so there's some really cool things we've been able to do and concepts that will allow us to focus on risk-based management. And I'm gonna start talking about that right now. So essentially what we're doing at these creosote and tar sites is we know that the, the NAPL is the source of the groundwater plume. So let's see if we can change the composition of that NAPL by enhancing removal 
of those handful of groundwater contaminants we're worried about and exceed criteria at the site. And if we can remove enough of it, can we decrease it so that its mass discharge is less than the attenuation capacity of the system and essentially contain that dissolved plume on site by natural attenuation at some point? Well, there's some questions that come up that we have to answer. And when we were looking at biosparging to enhance this process of weathering the NAPL in situ, we, we needed to understand was how does it change the NAPL composition? Uh, and then ultimately, can we achieve our project objectives, our remedial objectives with this process? So not to be outdone by uh, Mike Cafell, who's sort of shown us a few equations already. Uh, I think I beat him with this one. But um, essentially, what we had to do was try to understand whether or not we could deplete these contaminants out of an apple. And to be able to do that, we need to, we came up with a model to understand how those contaminants are depleted from the NAPLE. And so there's really two main processes. You've got dissolution from that NAPLE just by a clean groundwater moving through that. But that's a very slow, very limited process that's occurring at these sites. And mostly what's occurring at these sites is anaerobic biooxidation of these contaminants as they dissolve from the NAPL to the groundwater. And so most of these sites are very anaerobic, but half-lives and anaerobic processes can be 50, 100 days, very long. But under aerobic conditions, those half-lives can be less than a day. It can be a half a day, it can be a 10th of a day. And so essentially what this process does is as soon as it dissolves out of the NAPL, it's being degraded aerobically and so it drives that dissolution process and enhances that dissolution process of those groundwater contaminants from the NAPL and any other soluble compounds, these hydrocarbons that are in the NAPL. Well, to be able to evaluate this process and understand it and try to model it and produce it in the field, the key component that we need to understand is, well, what is the effective solubility of that compound, say naphthalene, from that napple to the groundwater. Well, that's controlled by Raoult's law. And this is probably a little bit different formation of Raoult's law than you're used to seeing because we're dealing with some very complex napples that have a lot of constituents that in their natural standard conditions, they're solids. And so you have to use this solid liquid fugacity ratio of that compound to be able to really understand the effective solubility of one of the compound out of a tar or a creosote. Well, what, again, the other thing that controls its effective solubility is its small fraction. So how much of that is naphthalene is in that napple? Well, that's a tough number to come up with because there's no easy way to estimate that without knowing the average molecular weight of the NAPL. And that's always been the challenge with these types of models is knowing what is the average molecular weight of your creosote or tar that can have thousands of compounds in it. You, you just can't send it to a lab and say, hey, what's the average molecular weight of the compound? And then if they do an analysis of all the constituents in that NAPL, they can't do all of them. And so you may only be able to analyze 50% of the compounds in that NAPL, and that's not enough information to estimate the average molecular weight of the NAPLE. And so again, the, the key thing here is we need to understand what the mole fraction of that constituent is in the NAPLE to be able to develop this solubility model for it. Well, I started talking to Dave Morrow with Meta Environmental about four or five years ago when we were trying to figure this out for some creosote sites where I was sitting across the table from EPA telling my clients we had to do steam enhanced extraction for $30 million. And my client was like, no way. And so we started to figure out what, what can we really do at these sites to reduce the risk and not have to do steam enhanced extraction. And so I started talking to Dave Morrow and he remembered some work that EPRI did in the early 2000s on this Raoult's law based method for estimating average molecular weight of TARS. And essentially what you do is you analyze the NAPL and so you get mass fractions of that NAPL. Then you take a small sample of that NAPL, equilibrate it with water, 
and then you analyze the water phase to see what is aqueous concentration. So you're essentially measuring what it, its effective solubility is in water from that NAPL using this laboratory method. And then you can start manipulating equations and plot the actual measured concentration in the water, which is C, by this, on the, and then on the bottom axis, this value G, which is a combination of known properties of that constituent. And the slope of that line, all these different constituents make is the average molecular weight of that NAPL. So I'm gonna show you some examples of that and that data um, while from this particular site itself. So the Daytona MGP site is a, a water gas tar site. And as I was mentioning earlier, there was pretty significant denapple source area that had created a dissolved plume that had migrated offsite. Uh, we have some VOCs and, and some PAHs, and the PAHs are, are primarily naphthalene. We did a study back in 2015 to first just to assess whether or not we can sparge air on the ground and can we degrade these compounds pretty quickly and establish aerobic conditions at the site. That was successful. And based on the success of that study, we developed a boundary, essentially biosparse transect. And the objective with that transect was on the down gradient edge of the site and to start to prevent any more mass discharge occurring from onsite to offsite and to clean up the offsite plume. And we saw some pretty significant success with that. After a couple of years, the offsite plume went away, but we still had this large source area and we don't want to have to be operating this biosparge boundary system for forever to, to manage that source area. Uh, the, the nice thing about that particular study, we actually had a, one or two sparge wells in the vicinity of a NAPL area where we were able to actually see some NAPL drain into a well. And so we were start to able to begin to assess how biosparging was affecting the composition of the NAPL at the site. And based on those results, uh, we just last year implemented the full site remedy for the full source area for biosparging. So here's the a NAPL of essentially uh, the untreated NAPL at the site. And this is that soluble model, solubility model I was talking about. And I was mentioned earlier, it's about 6% naphthalene in it. Uh, the other uh, constituent in that NAPL that we see quite a bit in groundwater is isopropyl benzene. The challenge with isopropyl benzene, the groundwater criteria is 0.8 micrograms per liter. And so if you just have any isopropyl benzene in your NAPL, you're likely going to exceed your groundwater criteria. But you can see uh, on the right there, the equilibrium solubility of naphthalene is about 9,400 micrograms per liter. And we, uh, we got to get that down to 14. And you can see in the plot itself how all these, when I, when I, that equation where the concentration versus this value G, they pretty much fall on the line. And the slope of this line is the average molecular weight. So it's about 200 grams per mole. And this is the untreated NAPL at the site. So if I take that information and I use anaerobic bio-oxidation rates, throw it in the, in the model, and look at natural attenuation and natural source zone depletion of the NAPL, it gradually will weather, but it's gonna take hundreds of years to achieve your groundwater criteria at the site. So it's just not really gonna be feasible. Uh, we, do, we can do this analysis for creosote sites. We've done it in feasibility studies with EPA as well. And so I wanted to show you some results from that early work we did with the initial um, biosparse system where we were treating some NAPL uh, with the boundary system. And so what you're looking at here on the left there are plots of the first two bars, the PRW2 and PRW4 and E. Those, those are NAPL from untreated areas. And so what we're looking at is a mass fraction of naphthalene, isopropyl benzene, 1-methylnaphthalene, and acenaphthalene. And all the way to the right, those same compounds, what the mass fraction in that tar is after approximately two years of treatment from another area that was within the treatment, the 2016 treatment at the site. And so when we grabbed a sample of that NAPL, 
that's been treated for two years and did the same study, the average molecular weight of that Napple is went from 200 up to 600 grams per mole. So we've removed a lot of the lower molecular weight soluble compounds from that Napple. And it went from having a viscosity of around 30 or 40 centipodes to being not measurable in the, in the over 10,000. And it's like almost like a beach tar when we try to get that Napple out of the well that's been treated for a while. So we've certainly seen some significant weathering of that Napple caused by the biosparging in a relatively short time period. So we took that information and now we're throwing it into the, the NAPL depletion model, trying to simulate our ability to decrease those mass fractions over that two year period. And what this model does is first that you have to estimate, well, what are the half-lives, uh, the aerobic half-lives of those compounds in the dissolve phase? And what the model does is as you deplete those compounds from the NAPL, it changes the composition of the NAPL, and now you have a new effective solubility, and that effective solubility continues to change over time as you deplete those constituents from the NAPL. And that's how the model essentially predicts how long it takes to remove these compounds. And at this particular site, what we saw is the half-life of naphthalene and isopropyl benzene under aerobic conditions are pretty fast. So that that's kind of these are the numbers we want to see we've seen similar numbers at some of the creosote sites you know granted the groundwater uh, temperature at this in florida is about 25 to 30 degrees c so it's it's pretty fast but we even had we've done this at in libby montana where it's 10 degrees celsius and we've seen pcp half-lives on the order of a tenth of a day So this is a, a model showing what it would look like um, trying to model forward now with the data that we have collected to date to understand, can we achieve our groundwater criteria at the site? Can we remove enough of these compounds from the NAPL that will achieve our groundwater criteria? And in this particular model, uh, we assume that the NAPL saturation in the pore space is about 5%, which is a little bit less than the average for the site. And it indicates that we could potentially achieve it in a reasonable time frame. Well, when I move that up to about the average NAPL saturation, the upper range of the NAPL saturation, when we did a bunch of petrophysical testing years ago on cores, about 8.6%, that time gets shifted out a little bit more. And so the time it takes to deplete these constituents from the NAPL not only is it dependent on your aerobic biooxidation rates, it depends on how much water is in the pore space with that NAPL. So if your NAPL saturation is higher, it's gonna take you longer because there's less water there for these processes to occur in that pore space. But still looking at some reasonable timeframes for potentially cleaning up the site and depleting these constituents from the NAPL. So based on all that, we, uh, implemented last fall, uh, the full site remediation system, biospar system at the site. Uh, it was, we were challenged with potentially adding another 30 or 40 vertical biospar wells at the site on an active service center facility with utility trucks, uh, a building with service staff in it. And uh, in the past, I've always didn't really have a favorable opinion of horizontal wells or special sparging because there's a, that issue of being able to control where the air goes along that horizontal line. And then I found out about this material called um, ADS pipe, and it's essentially HDPE, and you can see a picture of it in the bottom left-hand corner where they have a micro slot cut into it like every six inches or a foot, depending on how much air you need to, to, to get out of your line. And the way this works is those slots don't open unless there's, a, unless there's a five PSI differential between the internal and external pressure. So what that does is it forces uniform distribution of air coming out of these slots across the pipe. We ended up using three long biosparge wells to, um, to treat the whole site and pretty much cover uh, the area that we where we assumed all the sources based on years and years of investigation data. And this is the most recent performance monitoring data. We collected some samples last April. And so these are NAPL samples from areas that um, that are just now being treated for 
like the last, this is about six months worth of data. And you can see we're already starting to see some significant changes in the mass fraction, more in the more soluble, lighter molecular weight compounds like the BTEX compounds and the isopropyl benzene. Uh, in one area of the site, we, we were seeing more PAHs being depleted. And then uh, on the east side of the site, uh, it's taken a little bit more time to start seeing some of the decrease in those PAHs. But this is about six months worth of data in operation. So in summary, um, we have this really cool lab-based Raoult's law solubility model and method now that helps us understand and potentially model and predict the long-term dissolution of these compounds from the NAPL. Uh, and we've seen that biooxidation process can enhance the dissolution and weathering of these NAPLs. And you're able to use these simple mass balance models. And it's a, a pretty good tool to help us evaluate remedial alternatives in the context of a feasibility study and to be able to show to regulators that this is a viable approach. So essentially the take home message is, is that you know, dissolve phase remediation strategies you know, put, are potentially are viable alternatives for managing NAPL and remediating NAPL at sites. You know, a long time ago, we didn't think they were, but now in a risk-based environment where you don't have to get all the NAPL out of the ground or all the NAPL out of a well, now, there's some cost-effective alternatives that can be completed in a reasonable time. Uh, thank you. I'll take any questions if you have them. I actually have a question. Uh, I think earlier in the presentation, you mentioned the homogeneous aquifer. And I was wondering if you've had any experience with highly heterogeneous aquifers, both from a geological grand size perspective, as well as kind of a fill mixing perspective, and the alignment you would need to for, do for applying this for, sort of technology. For biosparging in this particular process. Yeah, we have um, the Libby, Mon we're doing this at the Libby Montana Superfund site right now, a big creosote site. And that has some heterogeneity with it, but that's more focused on semi-confined versus unconfined units. Uh, we have a site in Brainerd, Minnesota that we're doing this now, and that's a lot more heterogeneous. But you have to be careful. You know, the whole objective with this approach is the success depends on your ability to deliver dissolved oxygen. And so you have to be able to distribute dissolved oxygen, which because dif through diffusion, you can get more dissolved oxygen distribution versus say injection of some sort of liquid amendment sometimes. So uh, yeah, so we do have some experience in heterogeneous cysts conditions. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, so in the case where you've got stratification of relatively fine grain and relatively coarse grain layers, would it be feasible to inject um, somewhat uniformly as a function of depth. Could you design a sparge well so that you get even distribution as a function of depth so that you can get into the permeable layers and, and some, you know, the, the sparge bubbles are gonna go upward and they're gonna get trapped under the fine grain layers because there'll be capillary barriers, but can, can you distribute uh, sparge injected, you know, oxygen uniformly as a function of, of depth if you've got stratification? So that's, now we're talking about the whole different technology with biosparging and our ability to distribute air and dissolved oxygen. and. We, we've done several tests and different scenarios where uh, we just finished up a test in Minnesota where we saw significant, we saw limited influence 20 feet away from the injection well, but great influence 40 and 60 feet away. So there's a lot of heterogeneity there and your ability to distribute that oxygen it's you're going to have pockets that might take a little bit longer to get oxygen into. Now, when you start talking about 
systems where you may have a somewhat continuous lower permeability unit so that what you're trying to treat is maybe a deeper subunit that has good permeability, but it's semi-confined. And then you have another shallower unit above that that also needs to be treated. And so now your designs have to look at, you're, you're gonna have different distribution systems and delivery systems and different aquifers. And we're actually uh, working on a, and just tested a new well design that we call an air transfer well that will actually transfer some of the air that might get trapped in the deeper unit into the shallower unit actually end up being the source of sparge air for the shallower unit. Uh, so there's different ways to try to assess that and overcome it, but it's, you know, wells closer together or wells closer apart. It all, it, it you know, depends on what your field tells you about your site, so. Yeah. Um, you mentioned 60% as a, a recovery threshold. Uh, is that for hydraulic methods only? Yes. Yeah, those, those studies we did back in the 90s, um, especially we had two separate test cells at Hill. One was co-solvent flushing, which was my baby. Uh, we got about 60, 65% recovery of NAPL by focused on a few compounds. It was a complex, it was a mixture of chlorinated solvents and fuels that this was a fire training area for the Air Force Base. So is that 66% then with the co-solvent use? Say that again? It is the 66% removal with the co-solvent? Yeah, that was the co-solvent test cell. Okay. And then we had another one where we designed a single phase microemulsion system. So it's using a combination of alcohol and surfactants to create a micelle that is more of a solubility approach versus a mobilization approach. Mm -hmm. And that one's about the same 60 some percent. And what we saw, because we have a very detailed monitoring network of multi-level samples throughout these test cells, and we publish quite a few papers back in the late nineties on this is we could look at how much mass we removed in an interval and how many pore volumes of solution were we were able to put to that interval. And it all came down to our ability to contact where to, to deliver solution to where the NAPL is. And we have developed these metrics for efficiency versus effectiveness and efficiency being defined on how much poor volume of your solution you can get to, to that. Surfactant systems were a lot more complicated because not only do you have to get that solution to where the NAPLA is, you have to control its chemistry. And a lot of these surfactant chemistries are have a very narrow window when they're effective, especially if you're trying to create like a middle phase emulsion. So making make a NAPLA almost have the same viscosity as water to be able to flush it out. So very, very complex to do that. And I've reviewed some field scale applications that failed because you just can't control that chemistry and sit you over long distances. So those recoveries are, are not actually hydraulic only. They're with surfactants or, or co-solvents, but for hydraulic only, like water flood, like, like Marcus talked mm -hmm. about, do you have a ballpark number for the maximum percent of you know, Dean Apple that you might remove with water float only? Mm, probably, I mean, it depends on your, your permeability and, and heterogeneity. So, I mean, if you have a homogeneous gravel, you might be able to get 80% out or more. It's just hard to say. It's just, I don't know what that, what that residual saturation is and you're, looks like you're having to pump a lot of water for for the amount of NAPL. And that's the same thing with these these chemically enhanced approaches where you know, we can get lots of pore volumes through the high higher permeable portions of the subsurface. But to remove that NAPL from the lower permeability sections, it's almost difficult to get enough pore volumes through that media and to get the reductions. And it's not that we're reducing the mass by 60% uniformly it's we're, we're removing maybe 90 100 percent in this area that hits a lot of poor volumes but only 20 percent in a lower permeability zone where napo is also trapped yeah 
right. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. One right. more question. Why was the best session at the end? <laughs> best for last, right? All right. Well, well, any other questions? If not, we will um, take it into the home stretch. Norbert, did you have any words to conclude the conference? Just a couple of words. Thank you very much again for our distinguished panel of speakers. And on behalf of Gene Johnson, the entire organizing community, thank you very much for coming. I hope you guys had a good time, made some good connections, enjoyed the conference. We would love to have you back. We'll announce when, the, when is going to be the next event. Kudos to our audiovisual experts, David Parker and his team, who they make it all like it's easy. It's not, but thank you so much. Give us about a week or so. We'll send everybody email with copies of presentations, access to uh, whatever follow-up information is required, pictures. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.